Each channel strip in Pro Tools is made up of several sections. There are differences between the different types, but most of these sections are common to all the different strips. I'll go through a basic audio channel and then look at any differences in instruments and auxes and the master fader. Channel strips can be configured from the View menu, Mix Window Views. As you can see, there are a number of components I'm choosing not to display for this run through. Some relate to recording and others to more advanced applications. I'm just going to focus on basic mixing elements. At the top of each strip are the insert slots, up to two sections of five each. I've only got one of the two showing. Inserts are places to, well, insert or instantiate, to use the technical term, processing plugins in the signal path within that strip. Plugins are the heart of mix processing, covering everything from EQ and compression to delay, reverb, and even distortion. I'll do a more detailed overview in the video after next and cover the different processors in dedicated videos later in the course. Below the insert sections are the sends. Once again, two sections of five each. A send duplicates the audio signal running through the channel strip and routes the copy out of that strip to another strip in the mixer usually for further processing, or to interface outputs to the real world. In recording, sends are used to route copies of the tracks to a headphone amp feeding musicians cue mixes, providing a rough mix for them to play against as they record and overdub additional parts. In mixing, probably the most common application for sends is to route the signals from multiple tracks to a single reverb in an aux channel strip to allow different amounts of that reverb to be added to the various tracks in the mix. Again, there'll be a detailed explanation of that a couple of videos down the road. If an EQ plugin is in use, Pro Tools offers the option of displaying the curve applied in the EQ section for informational purposes. Below that is the I.O. section. Here you set the input and output for the channel strip. In recording, the inputs would typically be channels from the interface. For mixing, no input setting is needed. When a track is not record armed, the input is automatically the clips on that track in the edit window. Again. For mixing, the outputs would all be main out one and two, which sends the audio to the master fader, where all the audio signals from all the tracks are summed, mixed, together, into a stereo soundstage. However, it's also possible to route signals elsewhere in the mixer. I'll cover that again in a later video. Below I.O. are settings that apply to real-time recording and playback of mix automation, which of course will be covered in the second half of the course. Likewise, the group assignments relate to the groups pane we caught a glimpse of last time, which assigns multiple tracks to be controlled as a unit, a convenience in many mixing activities. The knob or knobs below are the pan controls, aka panners, which position that channel somewhere between the left and right speakers in the stereo soundstage. Mono tracks, naturally, have one pan knob. For stereo tracks, each side, left and right, can be panned independently for the greatest flexibility and positioning as well as for controlling the width of the stereo image for that track. Several buttons control various track-related functions. Most of these are probably familiar. S solos the track, muting all other tracks, while M mutes the track. By default, soloing different tracks solos them one at a time, but an alternate mode is available from the Options menu Solo mode. Instead of the default XOR mode, Latch mode allows soloing multiple tracks though that can also be done in XOR mode by holding SHIFT and clicking multiple solo buttons. Option click unsolos all tracks, and command clicking a track's solo button puts it in what's called solo safe mode, which makes it immune to being automatically muted when another track is soloed. This works in conjunction with send and return hookups, which once again, we'll look at a couple of videos down the road. Of course, the red button record arms the track, and the green I button puts the track into a dedicated input monitoring mode, a convenience when rehearsing an overdub before recording it. Finally, the channel fader controls the level of that track in the overall mix. Zero on the fader scale is unity gain, no boost or cut. The meters indicate the level of the signal in that track. For mixing, the meter reading would usually be set as post fader. It would reflect level changes made with the channel fader. That setting is made here, by turning off pre-fader metering, which is for recording. Just as with the EQ display, if a compressor or other dynamics plugin is inserted in the channel strip, an additional meter will indicate the amount of gain reduction being applied. But note, 
Both the EQ display and dynamics meter are only guaranteed to function with the included Pro Tools plugins or other Avid plugins. They may or may not be supported by third-party processors. Aux tracks share pretty much the same layout as audio tracks, just no record or input monitoring buttons, while instrument tracks have an extra I.O. section at the top for setting the input and destination of MIDI data coming into the track, like from a MIDI controller keyboard to a virtual instrument plugin, which would be instantiated in the first insert slot. The master fader has a couple of differences. As you can see, there's no send section, and though you can't tell visually, the inserts are in a different place in the signal flow chain. On regular tracks, they precede the channel fader. In the master fader, they follow it. And that gets us to an important issue. The order that audio flows through the different sections in a channel strip is not the order in which they're presented, top to bottom. Instead, the signal within the strip skips around from section to section. I'll explain in the next video.